Hey you guys, it's me again, Krista with Chris Cox Studio. Thank you for tuning in to our blog. Um, today, I'm gonna to be doing a quick FAQ on some of the most common question, commonly asked questions. I guess that's what FAQ means. Okay, so question number one is the question I get asked more than anything else is, Krista, what camera should I buy? This is like asking me what car you should get. I don't know, do you have kids? Do you like sports cars? Are you a truck guy? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of questions that you need to ask yourself when you're trying to think about what camera you need to buy. Number one, what's your budget? Because that's gonna kind of set the stage for everything right off the get-go. If you're a hobbyist, try to look at cameras that are around the 500, give or take a couple hundred dollars, get around that range. Um, these are the entry-level Canons, entry-level Nikons. Sony has some good cameras in that range. And um, it's not really worth investing thousands of dollars in a camera if it's not going to pay itself off. So start there, like Canon Rebel series and whatever Nikon's equivalent is. That's why I recommend starting for the hobbyist. Now, if you are a professional, you're starting to get into the photography field, you can get away with some of these entry-level cameras, but I caution you because you're probably gonna outgrow it a lot faster than you think. Um, I outgrew mine pretty quickly after starting my professional career. I had been doing photography for a long time up until then, and it worked just fine for my hobbies, but once I needed certain settings that it couldn't give me, I knew it was time to upgrade. So. If you are the hobbyist going professional, maybe you look for some of the more high-end entry levels. Is that an oxymoron? I don't know. But um, if you're just getting started, let's try to set your budget around the $1,000 to $1,500 mark. That'll give you a good range of cameras to look for. You know, these will be crop sensors. These will probably have a lens that comes with them. They'll have a built-in flash maybe, so you can kind of save a little bit as far as your overall budget goes. But um, kind of start thinking about your budget and your skills and where you're at with that. Now, if you're the professional, then you probably don't need my advice on this. Um, you probably already know what camera you're gonna get next, and it's more than likely gonna be anywhere from 1500 to 5000 There's a big range in there, depending on if you want crop sensor, full frame, and I can go over all of that in a future post. Actually, I'm pretty sure we just posted something about this. No, that's gonna be next week. So there's just a whole bunch of questions to think about, mainly your budget, what your skill level is, how are you gonna be using the camera? That's another one. So if you are a sports photographer or a family portrait photographer, you're not gonna need the same camera as a wedding photographer or a landscape photographer. You know, so kind of make a whole list of things that you need your camera to do like what purpose needs to serve, and then kind of focus. You know, don't be like, ooh, pretty $5,000 camera, when really you just need something much smaller. So that's my advice there. If you have any specific questions for me when it comes to um, getting a camera, feel free to ask me below, I'll respond. And also on my website, I've created a simple quiz. I think it's like five or so questions that you can walk through. And it'll in the end, it will actually give you a few recommendations. So check that out. Totally helpful. Question number two, what does DSLR mean? Okay, so it's not very complicated. You have a couple different types of cameras. You've got film cameras, you've got mirrorless cameras, and you've got DSLR. What DSLR means is that you have your lens here, and your sensor is back here, but your viewfinder's up here. Okay, well let's look at this. You're not looking at the top of your camera, you're looking through the lens. So DSLR stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex. So you've got mirrors inside your camera. You've got, if here's your lens, you've got a mirror here, a mirror here, and here's your viewfinder. So your image bounces up like that. That's how you see outside of your lens when your viewfinder's way up here. Now when you snap a photo, your shutter's open, this lens or mirror down here is gonna flip up. And then boom, light hits the sensor. That's how it works. That's why it's called single lens reflex. Fun fact that I just rediscovered, because I kind of knew it, but it's almost like, oh yeah. Okay, if you look through your camera backwards, so look at it through the lens, like through the lens, okay. You'll actually be able to see out your viewfinder. You won't be able to tell what's what because it'll be all out of focus and all distorted, but if you look, you'll be able to see that mirror. And it's just one illustration of how that pathway of light is traveling, it's going 
in your lens, up the mirror, up the mirror, and out your viewfinder. That's how that works. If you go with other camera types, they're gonna work a little differently. There's pros and cons to every single bit, and we're actually gonna have a review of Sony's, one of Sony's newest mirrorless cameras coming up here soon. I'm super excited about it. Sam's gonna get on that. Question three, what's a prime lens? Okay, also, simple question. So there's two types of lenses, um, in the camera world, you got a zoom lens or you have a prime lens. Zoom lens zooms in and out. Prime lens doesn't. So why would you ever want a prime lens? Depends again on how are you going to use your camera. So me, I shoot subjects that aren't moving. So I don't need to be able to zoom in and out and focus on them. They kind of stand still and we're good to go. Um, if you're shooting for uh, wildlife photography or sports photography, you're going to want a zoom lens. Um, Another perk to zoom lenses is oftentimes the inner components are a little bit better quality because they're not moving parts. Question four, do megapixels even matter anymore? Uh, yes and no. Again, as I've answered several times, it depends on how you're gonna use your camera, but chances are, no, it's not gonna make that big a difference if you have 22 and another has 24 or whatever they're coming out with these days. Um, the only time megapixels are going to be that big of an important issue is if you're having your photograph printed on the side of a building. Anything smaller than that, billboards, not really that big of a deal because everything's viewed from a distance. Any kind of photograph that's going to be printed in like a human scale where we're holding it, megapixels, it's not going to make that big of a difference. So don't get hung up on this. Look at some of the other components. Sure, it'll make a difference if you want to like zoom in really, really far and count the number of pixels in your picture. Nobody does that. Number five, do you need a website? I don't know, do you? <laughs> so I have a website because I photography is my career. I want to be able to broadcast the photos that I take. I put them on my website as portfolio. It's also a blog, so my website's a little more in-depth than most people. But um, if you're just starting out, or if all you do is photography, you could probably get away with just having a Facebook page. It's free. The downside to that is that you don't have your own domain. So people Google or search chriscox.com. Okay, that doesn't, wouldn't exist if I didn't have a website. By the way, my website's chriscoxstudio.com. There's a lot of good resources for websites that are easy to build if you do want to do one. So Squarespace, Wix, WordPress, all of these have super easy templates to set up with. So have at it. All right, next question. How do I deliver client? How do I deliver photos to clients digitally? Okay, I'm not chasing down people when I get their pictures done. All I do, I have an online software. It's called Pixie Set. You pay a, month, a yearly subscription. You can pay monthly too, I think. Doesn't matter. Um, and so when I finish photos, I upload them straight into the, my, my end of the Pixie Set, like the dashboard, whatever, create a little album, upload the pictures, boom. Once they're uploaded and ready to go, I shoot them an email with a link. They go straight in. It creates this beautiful gallery for them to look at all of their photos. They can download the photos. They can like the photos, comment. They can even order prints from it. So that's how I do it. I used to do the USB thing and chase people down way back in the day. Mm, not anymore. Too complicated. Now I just say, oh, here they are. Done. Next question. What's the best editing software? Uh, well, I'm not going to say what the best is, but I can say what the most popular is and what I use. So I use Photoshop. They kind of have the monopoly on the market, really. Um, a lot of photographers will use Lightroom. I use Lightroom if I'm shooting tethered, which means I have my camera hooked up to the computer. So when I snap a picture, it automatically imports into my computer. That's when I use Lightroom. But otherwise, I'm using Photoshop to do my edits, to edit anything in RAW. And um, that's just how I'm wired. Both are super great programs. Actually, I'm pretty sure Lightroom is just a baby version of Photoshop anyways. My graphic designer over here is the reason that I use Photoshop because I learned it long before I had access to Lightroom. So I use Photoshop check into Lightroom, especially if you're not going to be doing super heavy edits, which don't do heavy edits if you can avoid it. It makes it look fake. Another program that I use in conjunction with Photoshop is Adobe Bridge. It's kind of like a file organizer system. It lets you cull the photos, which pretty much means sorting out the junk, 
that's the easy version to explain that, but you can go through, you can rate your photos like on a scale, one to five. You can label them, say, nope, we're gonna go back and check on this one. And there's just a lot of ways that you can filter through with Bridge. And then you don't have to have all your programs open at once. You can batch edit photos with Camera Raw Editor in Bridge without ever having to open Photoshop. And if I'm speaking gibberish, I'll do a post on this one day soon. Yeah, it's just super handy to keep everything organized and stay tuned. If you have questions on how to use Bridge or Photoshop or Lightroom, ask me below. I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, this actually brings me into my last question. What is Camera Raw? Why do people use it? There's lots of different file types. You got JPEGs, you got GIF files, you got TIFF files, you got PNG files, and among other things, you have a raw file. So when your camera takes a picture, all the light hits the sensor. This is our sensor again. Light hits the sensor. Boom, if you have it set to record in a JPEG, it takes this information and converts it into a pretty picture that your computer can read. Now, if you shoot in RAW, it takes all this information and it just records the information. So when you put it onto your computer, your computer's like, ugh, what is this? I don't know what this is, I can't read it. There's lots of benefits to this and I only shoot RAW and here is why. So if you are just recording the basic image, you're not telling the computer to turn it into a picture then when you get it into a software that can read raw, like Bridge, like Photoshop, like Lightroom, then you can change all of this information without hurting the integrity of the photo. So that means I can adjust the lighting, I can adjust highlights, shadows, I can adjust white balance, I can even adjust focus very, very minutely with some of these dual pixel recording things. I can adjust curves. I can apply lens profiles. So if your lens is distorting an image, I can tell Photoshop, this is what lens I shot it with. And it goes, oh, this is what the picture should look like. Super handy, you can adjust perspectives. I mean, you can just adjust everything in RAW. It's pretty much like a free for all. That's why I use it. And I don't ever shoot JPEG, because if you, if you try to edit those things in JPEGs, you're gonna get what's called artifacts. And an artifact is just like little hints of technology. It's like, for example, an artifact on a film photography, film photograph, is if you see like little white specks on the picture. And what it actually was was dust on the film. That's, kind of, that's like an artifact. So there are digital artifacts like that too. And that happens when you are trying to edit JPEGs and other file types. Whereas with the RAW, you reduce a whole lot more of those. So that wraps up this FAQ. If you have more questions that I didn't talk on, be sure to mention them below or send me a message. I'll try to get them in the next round, which hopefully won't be too long. So um, thank you guys again for tuning in and like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. Really hope that you guys enjoyed this video. And go take that quiz to figure out what camera you need.